morning or afternoon or evening and happy new happy lunar new year happy how do you say i cannot say that uh all right so we start the lesson today is the it should be the third practicum but again jan stole the first one so i guess it's the second practicum we are a little bit staggered but we'll figure how to catch up um I start this lesson with sharing a few tools. You don't have to use them. This is what I use. I like them a lot. And I think uh, if I like that, perhaps you may like it. And you know, uh, that, that's nice, right? Nice sharing tools, I think. So one thing that I've been sharing, uh, I also shared last year, uh, it's this software to take notes, which is called Typora. Um, uh, and this software here allows me to write um, Oh, oh, okay. I don't know. I'm messing up. How do you change the zoom? Zoom in, zoom out, zoom. Oh, with a shift. Okay, there we go. So here I can write uh, markdown. All of this is markdown, but then also I can write LaTeX. Okay. Uh, and so this is like very convenient way to take notes for papers, I think. Uh, it's called Typora, T Y P O R A. It's uh, free. Uh, works on every platform. Uh, I like it. Uh, another tool that I've been using, uh, I started using it recently, but again, uh, uh, it's free for students. Is this thing called Notion. Uh, this is my control room. Here I have things for work, like do many things. Uh, these are private life. I don't know, gather pictures from Christmas. And then you can also have like pages with inside things, right? Like I have a page with media. And inside there is all type of media uh, I'm consuming from the internet, right? Like our, these are blog posts, uh, like blog, website, uh, to do uh, priority subject, uh, and then like, I don't know, the author and so on, right? Uh, another one, it's like, I don't know, books, for example, that I will start reading. Just I just started this stuff. This is all personal development. Maybe I get to improve myself or cooking, right? So just started again. I have another database with some recipes. Uh, I think it's very nice to uh, like to have like things in one place. And I'm, I'm going to start using this for research as well. I have articles. And here, for example, you can have a database with all possible articles that you've been reading and write notes. Each of them you can open and then inside you can actually write uh, LaTeX as well. Okay, so it is LaTeX, uh, supports LaTeX. So I think it's super cool. All right, promotion done. I'm not getting paid, right? So it's, it's not promotional, <laughs> promotional message, but I think it, it's nice. Someone say about uh, Obsidian, I haven't tried. Uh, perhaps it's good. If you didn't know about this, now you know. If you knew already, okay, sorry to waste your time. All right. So um, before starting the practicum today, we're going to be talking about training. But before talking about training, I need to make a very big distinction uh, and be very clear about the fact that if someone uses gradient descent, okay, no, okay, question to you. Uh, I'm reading the chat, right? How does someone train a network? What is the procedure for training a network? What is the algorithm that one uses for training a network? Answer in the chat. Gradient descent, yes. Okay, that is a correct answer. All right, so gradient descent is actually the answer, the correct answer, right? So every time I, okay, rely on PyTorch. Every time I ask this question so far, and now I don't know why you know the correct answer, uh, every time I ask, ask this question in class, everyone answers back propagation. And then I get uh, a little bit, you know, uh, I wouldn't say annoyed, but maybe yes, annoyed. I'm, I'm, again, I'm joking, right? Uh, what is back propagation? If I ask you, right? If you're, maybe you watch my videos already, but okay. If I ask you, what is back prop, right? What is used, what is back prop used for? Job interview, right? If I ask you, what is back prop used for? A way to comp compute the gradients. Cool. And that's it, right? So you don't train with backprop. Backprop just gives you the gradient. The training happens by stepping, perhaps using the gradient, right? Which is the gradient descent. Okay, fantastic. You already know everything. All right. So if I'm showing you this chart over here, 
Uh, I'm gonna be talking about inference here. Oh, this is another software, right? So I show you another one before, and this is a third third tool, okay? So this is called, um, how do I hide this bar? Uh, this one. So this is called uh, draw.io. Now they changed the name because I don't know. All right, so here I use all these shapes to draw the diagrams that Jan pointed out, right? So this is an observation because there is a, a gray scale, like there is a gray background. So this is an observation. I feed this one inside uh, this item here, which is a encoder, which is a delay in the advanced uh, palette, okay? Uh, and so I get my Y bar. So when my Y bar, uh, I put the X inside this function. So how is called this procedure? And you know, it has a name. I mean, it's a stupid name, but uh, before we talk about backprop, this is called, if it's not backward, it's type down something <laughs> in the chat. Forward prop, yes. All right, cool. So this is forward propagation, right? So you get an output Y bar given that you provide an input x to this module here. So this is the mathematical formula, which is like written in the wrong direction, right? I mean, the things I usually read from left to right. Uh, so x goes through the encoder to give me a y. And here it's written y is given by f to which you input an x. So again, I think the graphical version is more intuitive. Cool. So how about this thing over here? What do you see here? Can, can someone describe to me in, a, in words on the chat? What's the difference between the second row? Inference with new example, okay. Uh, both of them are inference, okay? So when I compute something given something else, it's called inference. So both of them are inference. But then what's the main difference so far of these two drawings? Can you tell, can you spot the difference? It's like, you know, <laughs> I can see the bar over the X, that's the first point. And then the second thing is that uh, the observation is the output, okay. And so there is no bar over the Y. Yeah, so there is no bar over the Y. This is the observation, it's gray, gray scale background. Uh, the, the bar is on top of this guy, right, over here. And so how do we find this X bar given I have my Y? Anyone can guess? <laughs> Back prop, yeah. I mean, I... <laughs> uh, okay, decoding would be using a different module, right? So decoding would be actually having here a, one of these guys flipped in the other direction. You feed this decoder with this Y and you're gonna get a X. So that's... Um, that is something called, um, how it's called? Um, blah inference, hold on. Okay, judge, and if you can type down, I forgot. Uh, okay, it's called blah, I forgot the word. Uh, no, no, it's not target. Uh, Okay, I'll let you know that later on, I forgot. But it's called something, amortize. Yes, thank you, Vlad. It's called amortize inference. Um, but uh, da, 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 you can do the inverse, but we don't do inverse. So what we do actually, uh, okay, it, it's, it's the following, right? So here you're gonna get the X is going to be the outcome of performing a minimization over how far the network is output is from my target, okay? So yeah, Judge pointed out target prop. Uh, so we have a target, which is our actual uh, observed Y, which is this Y without the bar. And then we have something that the network output, okay? Which is this thing over here. And then you just do gradient descent such that you get the network to shoot to as close as possible to this Y by changing X, right? And so finally you end up by using gradient descent with the X that has the model provide the closest answer to our target, okay? Uh, it's not tractable. This is like gradient descent, it's neural networks, right? Right, so the parameters are fixed. Uh, the network is given to you already. 
like before we didn't no one asked me you know about the the parameters of this network here so here we already assume uh in the first case right who was asking colin uh in this case we also no one asked me oh are the parameters fixed yes of course the parameters are fixed here is the same right so this guy this network is already given to you how do you find the input that gives you a specific output by minimizing the uh you know difference between what the network out actually outputs which is this one with uh, the actual observation, right? And so this is still inference, but the outcome, like the output of uh, inference is a solution of an optimization problem, right? And so again, if someone's asked you, is backpropagation used only for training? This is a important question. Let's say it's an exam question, right? We don't have exams, but okay, whatever. So my, if you see this question, right? Job interview. Is backpropagation used only for training? Answer. What do you answer? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. That's it. Uh, nope. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. All right. Try out this one. Draw a uh, yaw. And draw, use this stuff, these diagrams, right? Delay and then the circle. You can also turn on the LaTeX extra, uh, okay, dark theme, of course. So do you know why I use dark background? Do you know why I use dark theme? Because bugs are attracted by light. <laughs> okay, all right. Now you know, okay. All right, sweet. So we starting today lesson, right? Uh, 10 minutes delay, no, 15 minutes. Right? Okay, I, you, I gave you something already, right? So we, we learned that backprop is not only used for training every, every, every year, but this year, everyone answers me that backprop is how we train networks, which is not correct. Uh, and you figure that also gradient descent can be used for inference, okay? And actually we, so, we see very soon that this is like what is the, uh, standard way of like the more generic way of, of doing inference. Cool. So what do we talk about today? Uh, training, right? Yes. So today we are going to be talking about training after I talk about this stuff that is not training. And so we start from here. All right. So again, sponsorship, no sponsorship, just come over to Twitter and see and say hi. Uh, and that's me. Alf. Okay. Now this is just for making people smile during conferences, like during talks. So people don't get scared. All right. So we're going to be talking about classification. Why am I talking about classification? Because I can show you that everything that is done in machine learning, we can do it deep learning. And it's a very easy way to explain things because in theory, you should already know all this stuff. So, uh, perhaps I don't have to go that slow. Although if I'm too fast, you know, slow me down. There is a button on the reaction, go slower or oh, go faster up to you. Okay. All right. Sweet. Uh, okay. So what, what, what is the outcome or the outcome here? Well, the, the, what are we trying to do? So here I'm just showing you, uh, a few spirals, like a few branches of a spiral. And which is simply, you know, I can, I can draw by using a parametric formula uh, I written down there. And then T goes from zero to one, right? So zero, are, you're in the center, then you go to one, it's gonna be the tail. And then you have capital K uh, spirals, right? In this case, we have uh, three of them. Uh, let's make things a little bit more uh, interesting so we can add some noise there. And so you end up with this kind of more realistic you know, data. So what is the, um, what is the objective of uh, classification? So what, what does classification do? So I am asking questions here, right? To figure out what is your knowledge, right? So, uh, given this data set, okay. I didn't specify things, right? I, I'm trying to understand your understanding given this drawing. Okay. What is the but possible way of doing classification here, right? So what is the input? What is the output? What am I trying to do? Type in the, in the chat. No one writes anything. <laughs> so this is not a, a, a okay. Multi-class classification. Yeah. What, what am I trying to do here? What is my objective? 
define okay define decision boundaries oh, okay too many people right okay so the, the define decision boundaries okay perhaps uh input should be a data point what is a data point uh okay what is the size of the input here Okay, input are points in a 2D space, right? So uh, a 2D coordinate is one, like one, one of these points here, tac. This is the, the, the 2D location, right? The X and Y location is going to be my input. What is my, um, what is my target? So what, what should I, given this location here, what should I do? The color, right? Should I say, should, I should, should say red. If I take this dot over here, what should I do? What I, I should say it's yellow. If I take this dot over here, I should have my classifier say it's purple. Uh, okay, sweet. So what is the easiest way to do classification? Just linear classification, right? I mean, I'm just drawing straight lines, right? I'm gonna be doing like, uh, like this, duck. And so this is my classifier. Okay. We're going to be training this on in a second. Uh, awesome. Right. What is the problem now? <laughs> error. Okay. What, what is the error? What, what is the issue here? So, okay, sweet. That, that was the keyword, right? So these regions here, like these branches, these spirals are not linearly classifiable, uh, separable, right? So I can't use possibly a linear separation, a linear boundary here to tell apart different uh, spirals, okay? And so how do we deal with this, right? Well, so again, the issue here is that there are all these intersections that are gonna be, uh, you know, not, bring, not leading us to, uh, to, to have a good result, right? All right, so on the left-hand side, this is what, when I was doing my PhD, I was naively thinking, oh, my network is unwarping the space, right? Like that. Basically here, I undid my, <laughs> my, my, my parametric function. Uh, when I train a network instead to fit this data uh, from the input perspective, where I still see all these things in the like input space, I can look at the final decision boundary, which were linear because, you know, we only have each module is linear, but then we have a non-linearity, right? So if I look at the last one, it's gonna still be a linear, but then if I look at the output uh, from the input, I can see how these output uh, linear boundaries will be morphed around, okay? So this is on the right-hand side is what usually you see uh, in most of the tutorial online on blog posts and so on. Uh, but I don't like it. I like more the left one, right? to see how things are warped around, right? And that's why I show you last time in, in the first lab, the, this animation, right? Which is gonna be coming up as soon as I show my screen again. All right, here. All right, so, uh, at the beginning, I show you these five branches. Again, each point is a 2D location, and then I have a capital K equal five. So I have five different possibilities. And this is actually what really, really happens, right? And so what I'm doing here, I'm just doing a linear interpolation between my input to a embedding layer. I'm gonna be uh, drawing this in a second. But what I'm trying to show you is that before uh, getting to the output of the network, this embedding layer, which is going to be uh, in, shown to you in a second when the, the animation ends, ends up, like finish, complete, uh, you see that these classes are now linearly separable, okay? So all the previous chunks of the network does is going to be basically warping this, you know, this, this, this space, right? I, I like to call it space fabric because it looks like, you know, a piece of napkin. Uh, and so the point is that the network unwarps what is this data, no? And lets you have it linearly separable. And then I use different planes. So uh, this green one over here, it's a plane that goes up this direction. Then if you have another plane going up the other direction, it's gonna be a yellow one. The intersection of the two planes is gonna be a line, right? So you have this line over here. Then if I have a third plane going the other direction, you have an intersection between a plane and with a line, which is going to be a point, which is this point over here. Instead, this one here is going to be the intersection between the yellow and the, and the blue. 
But then I have another plane, no? And so you have another uh, line here and so on, right? So here you have basically f five planes. And if you don't know why there are five planes, you can spend more time with the math and playing around, but that's not important. Uh, here you can see how the final layer can be separated by these intersections here, you can see, uh, which is, these are intersection between planes, okay? So there are basically, we, I can call it even uh, hyperplanes, right? So there are basically, uh, I can chop this space that was unwarped. Before it was all warped, it was impossible to linearly separa separate. Now the neural net basically unwarps the space such that it can be linearly separable. Cool. So what am I showing over here? And now it's going to be drawing time. So what I'm showing you right now is going to be uh, is the following. So here I show you a network which has uh, two inputs, which are my X and Y coordinate. Then it goes up to 100 neurons. These are 100. One hundred neurons. Uh, so my first matrix. What's the size of the the first matrix? So, so if I have here my W one matrix, uh, this is a matrix of size whose two times one hundred. Are we sure? Okay, we are always using column vectors. Okay, thank you. Hundred by two. So. The height of the matrix is going to be the, the dimension I'm shooting towards. Uh, so this is going to be 100. And then the width of the matrix is going to be the dimension I'm shooting from. Okay. So I look from here and this is going to be where I'm going to. So I have 100. So the, the, the height is what tells you the outcome. I mean, if I use column vectors, right? I know I, I draw them horizontally, but because I tell you why in a second, why? So then here I have my nonlinearity, which is going to be a ReLU. Uh, and then here I'm going to have uh, down to two neurons again. And then I have two, five. Okay. And the network, this is the input, right? Input, this is the output. And networks are always going this direction. Why is that? Because you go high in the network, you go high in the hierarchy. So what you have here on top, it's a classifier, right? So usually people say, oh, you just put a classifier on top, right? So this is my classifier. This is a linear classifier on top, right? Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so why do I have this intermediate layer over here? Well, in this way, I can do a linear interpolation between this guy uh, and this one, right? So I can do like 100% uh, this one, then I have 99% 1%, 98, uh, 2%, 97, 3, and so on, right? And so that's how I, I, I show you the animation before. And how do we train? How did we train this network? Well, we're going to be covering this right now, okay? The important part here is that I use here 100 neurons in the intermediate representation, okay? And this is why things are so nicely behaved and smooth and work so nicely. Later on, before the end of the class, I'll show you a network which only uses two neurons. And it actually is a very deep network, but only has two neurons all along, okay? So, Possibly a network with two neurons can move things in a, in a plane, right? But the nice part here with uh, using 100 neurons is that you can move things in 100 dimensions. So you have much more freedom of moving things around and then you can project them back to two dimensions. And going in a high dimensions, things are much more separated and more easy to move things. So the uh, 
the, 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 what's called the optimization process in a high dimensional space is much easier, right? Things are not constrained. If you go, if you try to do a optimization pr uh, process only by using two items, like I show you right now, like a network, very tall network, but you, having only two neurons each layer, try to train the thing is like a nightmare. I try, it doesn't, I mean, I, I managed to make it work, but again, it's like more of a hack and I show you as well the outcome. Okay. So this is just to give you a small, uh, like explanation of what I show you on the first lab. Okay. Clear so far, right? Let me see. Yeah. So far, everything is fine, right? So this is half class so far. Yes. No, you have thumb up, thumb down, green, green circle, <laughs> two green cir circle, three. Okay. Okay. All right. Nine, eight. Okay, there is a portion of the class who's following. There is someone clapping. Okay, yay. All right, sweet. Uh, let me move this bar away again. So we're going to go back to the slides and let's figure out uh, how we train these networks. Okay. And every time I go, I present something, these bars appears in front of my face. There we go. Okay. Bar away. Okay. 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 So training data. Uh, so the network we saw last time, uh, well, the, the, on the second practicum that they perform arbitrary transformation of these points. Uh, then we have to enforce the basically transformation to be, uh, to be like, you know, following a specific, uh, like to be instrumental to our task, right? So now we would like to do uh, classification of points. So I have to introduce the training points. So my input, uh, which is going to be always in pink and it's a bold vector. So it's a bold uh, symbol, which means it's a vector. In this case, for me, my X, uh, the example I is going to be belonging to Rn. So there are N components in X. Um, and then here I have my capital X, which is going to be, it's called my design matrix where it has all my column vectors lying on the side. Okay. So, uh, in this case, my X with the parentheses are the horizontal the transpose version. Okay. And so I have all of them stuck on one after each other. And this is what happens as well in a, in a, in PyTorch. Okay. But again, this is the design matrix. So I have N columns and then I have M rows. Uh, in, on the right hand side, instead I have my CI, which is going to be my class, right? It can be one, two, for example, five in the last, uh, in the last draw in the last animation I show you. So here I have my collection M items, right? One per each sample. So the X one will have the C one. The X2 will have the C2, right? The class number two. The XM, like the input. So X means input for me, right? So the X, the M input will be associated to the class CM. Uh, so I have M uh, labels, right? So these are my labels, my classes in this case. So I have three, okay, three or five classes, but these are the labels associ associated to each data point, okay? Uh, a way to encode these labels is going to be using the one hot. So what's one hot? One hot simply says, oh, okay. Uh, since one, two, three, there is a like ordering, like in the numbers, I don't want to use ordering. I just use a vector of all zeros and only one, one, only a, a one in the position, which is, uh, you know, uh, representing my given class, right? So if I had just three classes, uh, I will have these vectors here that will have uh, three components, right? So ideally this thing will have capital K uh, components, right? And so this one refers my first, uh, is my first item, right? Like first class, second class, third class. Uh, M is the number of data points, right? So I have one, two M data points. And therefore each of each data point will have its label. So C1 is the label for the example X1. C2 is the label, you know, for the X2, right? So XM belongs to class CM, right? So CM will be, you know, one, two, or whatever. Um, 
C is the output label. C is the label. No, C is not Y. I didn't talk about Y. Why? why wait, who's talking about Y? K classes distributed as labels over M points. That's why. Yeah. So far, everything is okay, right? I think so. Uh, otherwise, please, Vlad, judge and answer questions I cannot catch. All right, cool. So what do we need now? So now I'm going to be introducing my Y. So what is this Y? Y is going to simply be, in this case, my one hot encoding of these numbers. Okay. So in this case, there will be capital K uh, columns, right? And then I'm going to have uh, M rows, right? So one Y per given X and the given Y will have a one in correspondence to the uh, index represented here, right? So if this is two, then the, you know, you're going to have this guy here, right? The second item is going to be set to one. If CM is three, then you will have this uh, Y is going to be equal to this one. Okay. Capital C is the class index. There is no capital C. There is lowercase c, but yeah. Uh, why is one hot? Yeah, okay, Justin is explaining. Sweet. All right, cool. So here we have that my y i, right? The ith sample, the y ith uh, label, basically. Uh, it's a, a zero or one, right? It's binary with K, capital K elements, right? So you're going to have as many elements as capital K, and then the kth over the, yeah, the kth element is going to be set to one, right? Which is told to you by this number. Meaning if this one is going to be red, you're going to have the one on the red. So it's going to be red, purple, yellow, right? So if this coordinate here should be ye yellow, you're going to have the one in correspondence to the yellow column. If this point here is supposed to be purple, you're going to have the one in correspondence of the purple. So each column is going to be red, yellow, purple. Okay. And each of these rows is going to be one to the coordinate uh, I show you in the, in the drawing before. Uh, cool. So fully connected layer. Again, we are revising this one. So I let me know if I'm going too fast. I have my input at the bottom. Then I have a matrix W H uh, it's bold. So it's a matrix. You know, this already now, uh, then we go to a H in green, which is my hidden layer. Also, this one is bold, which means it's a vector. And then we're going to have another matrix, WY, which is going to be mapping. It's going to be rotating H to go to the final Y hat. So these are the equations, basically, like the, the only equations we're going to be seeing, basically. We have the H is going to be my squashing function F applied to the affine transformation of the X, right? And then you have that the y hat is going to be this squashing function g applied to the affine transformation of this part here. And we already watched and seen this very extensively last time, okay? In the like in the in the previous practicum. And this squashing function can be the positive part, the sigmoid, the hyper hyperbolic tangent, the soft arc max, and whatever you want. Okay. So let me draw this in an extensive manner, right? So this is like a more condensed uh, neural diagram, right? Where these are supposed to be like clusters of neurons. Here I'm going to be drawing each separate neuron. So this is my input neurons, also called X. Then I have my, let's say, first hidden layer. That's why it's called H for hidden. Then I have the second hidden layer. Then I have the uh, third hidden layer and so on and then until I have my final output layer. And so here I can see there are uh, the first layer is going to be called also A1, like the activations of layer one. They have layer two, three, four, until the last one. Now we have five, um, five layers in this case, right? So for me, layers and it's basically, well, the layers are the collection of neurons. And I do count the, the first layer to be the input layer. And to move from the A1 to A2, you're going to be using the matrix W1. Then you have matrix W2, W3, and W whatever L. Okay. So how do we compute, let's say, the, the first 
uh, hidden neuron, right? So let's focus on the first element on the hidden layer, right? The first hidden layer. So this, this item here will be simply uh, be my AJ, right? The Jth neuron at the second layer, which is going to be my squashing function applied to this uh, scalar scalar product between the WJ and X plus this uh, bias term over here, right? So first of all, what is WJ? Well, WJ, it's simply the Jth row, right? Of the W1 matrix. Uh, again, you should write down on, on a piece of paper if this is not uh, like clear. And what is the uh, scalar product? Well, the simply is the summation of all the uh, product, the, the product, right? So the element wise, like you have like the uh, element wise product, then you sum them all. And then there's going to be one more uh, offset term here. And then we apply this squashing function F. And so basically you have that all these input X uh, on the left hand side are multiplied by some coefficients that are those W's. They are all summed together and displaced by the BJ term to give you the first value, which has to go through this squashing function. Second one, same stuff. You have all the inputs multiplied by a second bunch of weights. Uh, which are these weights, yeah, the, the coefficients, they are summed together, then we displace by the bias term, and then we apply a squashing function. Is F function a kind of sigmoid? No, F can be anything, it's written down here, right? F can be the positive part, like ReLU, the sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, the soft argmax, whatever you want. It's just a non-linear function, because if you only have linear function, what is a linear function of a linear function of a linear function of a linear function? Linear function, <laughs> okay. Actually, I mean, yes, on paper, not on computer. So there is a paper from last year where they train a network which doesn't have nonlinearity, still works. They use the floating point approximation as nonlinear function, but okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> All right, uh, so that's why we need to put something that is nonlinear, right? Piecewise linear. What, 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 what was the question? No, if you have a linear function of a linear function of a linear function, it's still linear. There's no piecewise. Piecewise is if you, if you use a ReLU, which is basically selecting regions. All right, so how do we get the whole layer? Well, you just do the same for all, all of them, right? Boom. And this one is done in PowerPoint. So I drew every line by hand. Don't do it again. Like, don't try to replicate. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, painful, okay? Uh, then guess what? Uh, I, I have all these weights collected in that matrix down there, okay? Same for the second hidden layer. Uh, you try to do copy and paste, it doesn't work. So I had to draw again by hand uh, because they are not aligned, right? See, they see there is an offset, so again, painful. Anyway, so every, every neuron is uh, multiplied by, so every neuron here, has one weight, then this one has this weight, this one has this weight, this one has this weight, all of them are multiplied by a weight, a coefficient, then they are all summed together here. And then you apply a squashing function, right? Here. And then you get this value and so on, repeat. And then all these weights are stored in this matrix. Now, yes, we can use copy and paste to make the following. And then <clears throat> finally, you end up with the last one, which uh, you're going to store here the weights and then the final outcome, uh, again, are is still thing, right? So, I mean, this is just multiplying uh, values by coefficient, summing, and then applying some nonlinearities and then storing this stuff in a weight matrix for later usage. <sighs> what are you using to make this visualization? A mouse and PowerPoint. Uh, all right, so back here. Uh, summary, right? So X maps to H mapped to Y. So these are the mapping function, uh, fine transformation to which you apply a squashing function. Uh, these are the dimensions. Again, uh, if you just check later, right? If you are comfortable with the sizing, whatever. And then these are the squashing function we may use. So what I want to say here is that 
my y, y hat in this case, is going to be a function of my input, right? And so you can think of, you can think about the network y uh, as mapping is a function mapping my input rn towards rk, right? So mapping these axes towards this y hat. But again, what we really are doing here <clears throat> is actually mapping this input rn to a usually larger space, intermediate space rd, and then back to this rk, right? So usually we have this, this d needs to be way larger uh, than the input if you hope to be able to disentangle the input, right? So usually the input is really like cram in a little tiny space, and it's really, really hard to tell apart, right? So that's usually what deep learning has been very su successful to do, right? It's been able to unwarp like this thing. So first thing, you need to explode it in a large dimensional space. <clears throat> and then when it's in a large dimensional space, you can move things around much easy and easily. And then when you're done, down back to the domain uh, dimensions, okay? But there is always this kind of upsampling or up spacing, whatever you want to call it. Even if you're using images of one megapixel, you still have to go and explode the dimension in a very controlled manner, right? Because if you have a megapixel, you cannot use like a few more millions hidden layers, right? So there, we cover that in a, in, a, in, a, in a future lesson, but we still need to go in a higher dimension in order to be able to move things. So this is the answer to the first question from last lesson, right? Why do we go in high dimensional space? Because in high dimensional space, things are easy to move. And so the optimization algorithms actually can work. It can move things around. And then when you're done moving, then you go back to the dimensionality uh, you actually work with. Okay, cool. So two more slides, and then we go to the notebook so that we finish on time, perhaps. So in this case, my input are two dimensional. We go to a hundred dimensional intermediate representation, then back to three. Okay. And that was the example I show you, uh, I think for, for okay, I, I guess for the, the, this example here on the, on the spire, right? Then I use five, uh, on the animation just to make more, uh, prettier in the outcome, right? All right. So neural network training, first slide of two, how do we train this network? Uh, you have a reminder of the equations on the top right. So we're going to be using this soft argmax, okay, which is simply the uh, the ratio between the exponential of a given component by the sum of all these uh, other exponential of the all, all the components, right? So you have one component, you take the exponential, you divide by the exp of all the other components. Um, of course, this stuff will never be lower than zero or even equal zero, right? You cannot get like exponential is a positive function, so you can't go to zero, nor you can exceed or be equal to one, no? Because this, the bottom will always be larger, like the, the, the denominator will be always larger than the numerator. So it will never reach one. And all of these quantities are positive, right? So this is uh, like, within zero one extrema um, excluded, right? And so the L there stays for logits. The logits is the final output of, uh, of the network. Usually it's the output, the linear output of a network, okay? That's the definition. So I'm gonna define here my loss, my curly L, right? My loss over the entire data set, right? My entire Y hat and so sorry, my, my Y hat, which is the output of the network, given the whole inputs, right? The, the whole X, and then the correct class, C. C is the correct class. And so this is gonna be simply my average, no, one over M summation that goes from one to M of this lowercase curly L, right? And so these are called my pair sample loss function. So here I have one outcome, right? My Y hat, the ith, for the ith input, right? And then the correct class for the ith item, right? And so what do I use here? Well, right now I'm gonna be using the following. So my loss, my, my per sample loss is gonna be defined in this case to be the minus log of the y hat at the location told me by the 
correct class, okay? And again, this is going to be also called uh, cross entropy, negative likelihood. We don't care right now. I'll just show you what, what I'm doing, right? Uh, may I ask why there is a dot on top of the equal sign? That means it's a define, right? So I define it right now. Like, yeah. So what happens if I have an X in my correct class? Uh, C can be from zero to capital K minus one. Yeah. No, one to capital K, actually. I count from one in, in math. Uh, how about X? Uh, how about I have an input X and C equal one? Okay. So let's say my, uh, my Y, no, the one hot version is going to be the, the first item is equal one, right? So I count by one, one, two, three. These are three items, right? So C1 means I have the one in the position one here. And then my network basically says, oh, okay. So given the X, I say roughly one, roughly zero, roughly zero. Okay, first of all, uh, what is roughly one here? Who can like, who can see who can say more precisely what is roughly one on the chat? No, no one. Tends to one. See from which side? <laughs> okay, yeah. So this is one minus, right? And so those other here, what are these? Zero, yeah, zero plus, right? These two. All right, so if you apply this, uh, this one to, to the loss, given the label is one, you're going to get the minus log of uh, one minus, which is, how much is it? Log of one minus is, yeah, there's a minus, right? Zero minus. Then there is the minus in front. Zero plus, yeah. So this one goes to zero plus. Similarly, if I have the network telling me, oh, no, no, this is the other one, right? So you're going to be having that the loss is going to be the log of zero plus, which is minus infinity. Then we have the minus in front. We're going to get plus infinity, right? And so if the network makes a mistake, a very big mistake, you're going to get the loss that goes to plus infinity. Otherwise, the loss is going to be going to zero. Uh, I'm going to be showing very quickly this part here, but you are already familiar. So because again, we are going to be going to the notebook. So I have my capital theta is going to be the collection of all the parameters. So all my W's and biases are all here. W stays for weight, B stays for bias, and capital theta is for the collection of parameters. Uh, I define here, I just change a variable, right? So instead of having this curly L, which is function of the output of the network, I have a capital J function of the theta, but they are the same function. And this is a positive function. So let's assume it looks like this. This is my J uh, given a scalar, uh, scalar parameter only, right? So I have my initial value, my theta zero. I compute the value over here. I have my J at theta zero. I see what is the derivative. The derivative is positive, means I have to go, so this is my positive derivative at the location theta equals zero. And this is a number, right? So all this green thing with the purple, the orange thing, this is just one number, a positive number. And so given that I have a positive number, I know I need to go to the left hand side. And so I will change theta zero by a negative. So I have to put on this one minus, right? This positive numbers to go to the left hand side. And so, yeah, this is my stepping size, right? My, my, my coefficient, right? I had to step towards the negative direction of this thing here, no? because I want to go to the left, given that this value is positive. So I need to put a minus in front. And this is my green descent, right? So how to compute these partial derivatives? Well, I just use my chain rule here. And the same for the other parameter, right? So this was with respect to the wy, this is with respect to wh. And so here I'm going to have, you know, the just chain rule again. You're going to be chain rule, right? Back propagation. But you already answered correctly to this question at the beginning of the class. So I'm positive you understood so far. 
In the last five minutes, we're going to be looking at PyTorch, OK? Uh, if there are questions, we'll take them offline on the campus wire or after uh, we are done with the, with the, with the PyTorch part. OK, so boom. Again, this go away from my face. Go here. All right. So we go to CD, work, GitHub, PyTorch, deep learning. Then you do Conda, activate, PDL, right? PyTorch, deep learning. Then we do, uh, I show you that I have this one, right? So this is my Jupyter notebook. Okay. And it's opening here. One moment. There we go. So I'm going to be opening this spiral classification. Let's go full screen. And let me hide the bar. Uh, I don't know what happens here. I will choose PyTorch Deep Learning Kernel. And so we're going through the code. I still see you here. OK, awesome. Uh, let me zoom a little bit. Maybe it's fine now. All right, so I import random crap. I import some drawing libraries. You need to clone the, the whole thing, right? So there are instructions on the repository. Here I set, I set some default uh, settings for plotting. And then here I choose a device. We already covered device in the other, other lab. Here I just draw my spirals, OK? So there is no much thing we should spend time there, right? So this is my uh, spiral, OK? So in this first lab, you're going to be learning how to train, no? We just apply the things I just show you in the slides. So we start first by uh, training something that is made of two linear models, right? So in this case here, I had that my model is going to be two linear layer. The first one maps from should be n to d, right? So maybe someone should fix this thing because it's bothering me. And now this one goes from my input uh, x that has n dimension to d of the hidden layer. Then we go from d to the capital K, right? Uh, so this is my, my, my neural net, right? Well, it's a linear model. It's not too nice, but I guess that's what we have. So here I define my criterion. And again, if you want to know how this cross entropy works, this is simply the minus log of the uh, output of the correct location I showed you before. You can click inside here. You can do shift tab. Okay. If you do shift tab, you're going to be opening the uh, documentation. You can place this one in order to see the full description here, right? Okay. All right. So we pick this loss. Uh, we pick an optimizer, which is simply doing stochastic gradient descent, which is applying, you know, the negative uh, gradient. And so we're going to be looking at uh, how to train this stuff, right? So how does the training work? So first step, you're going to have that the uh, we predict the outcome. So we, we feed the input to the model, right? So this is going to be feed forward pass. This is step number one. So you have to feed forward the input. Step number two, compute the loss, right? So the loss is going to be simply that minus log, blah, 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 which is my criterion over here. And so here is step number two. I provide my prediction and the label to my criterion to get the loss. So step number two. Here I just compute some uh, accuracy. We don't care. Step number three. Uh, step number three is this zero grad. So what does zero grad? So in the PyTorch, we never compute the gradients from scratch. We always accumulate to whatever we had before. Uh, this is very convenient whenever we use more complicated architectures and whatnot. Uh, so instead of just you know erasing everything there was before, if there was something before, I just accumulate something on top, right? And so we, since we just want to compute the gradients in this case, I have to zero out whatever it was uh, stored before. This was step number three. Step number four, we compute backprop, which is computing the partial derivatives of the loss 
with respect to the parameters, right? So this is my fourth pass and then the, the, the fifth step. So there are five steps. The fifth step is going to be stepping. This is going to be going, jumping in the opposite direction of the gradient. Gradient says, oh, that is the direction of maximum increment of my function. Well, step that direction, okay? So what are the five steps? Feed forward, right? You have to feed the network with the input here. Second point is going to be compute the loss, uh, I guess, with this given specific criterion, uh, like cross-entropy in this case. Uh, third point is going to be clear up the gradients because PyTorch keeps like a buffer of all previous, like of the previous uh, gradients. The gradients are the partial derivatives of the loss with respect to the weights, okay? Fourth point is going to be uh, computation of these, uh, basically of the, of, the, of the partial derivatives. Backprop actually does the accumulation, right? So if you want to just compute them, you need to clear up this stuff before. And fifth step is going to be stepping in the opposite direction. Is backward just propagation? No, backward is back prop, uh, is back propagation plus accumulation. Okay. So if you want just to, if you just want backward, you need to clear up. So you need these two things together in order to compute the partial derivatives. All right. If you don't have this line over here, then you will accumulate to whatever there was before. So. Uh, you just want to get, in this case, new gradients without remembering, without re regardless of whatever uh, was stored in advance, right? So when we call model X, it actually calls model forward, no. Uh, forward, it does other things. I mean, it does also call model forward, okay? But we didn't talk about forward, right, so far. So this is how you feed a model, right? With the input, given that you define the model in this way. There is no forward yet. Cool. So, all right. So we have the uh, losses, whatever the, okay. What is the original, what is the first value of the loss here? Now it's 0 0.86 at, at the end of training. Uh, question for you, let me know next time. What was the, the first value? Second question, what is 0 0.5? How is this model doing? Is it going well? Is it doing bad? Is it random? What is it? Is it bad? Why is it bad? Not great. Is it like chance? Okay, why is it chance? Okay, oh, wait, hold on, two classes. How many classes are we training on? Okay, there are three classes. So 0 0.5 is not too bad, right? Ah, uh, yeah, all right, cool. Anyway, it's not either too good. Uh, and here I'm just showing you the model, right? So this is the, th the first thing I, I, I show you before, right? In, in, uh, in, the, in the slides, right? So this is my linear model, right? So, okay, not too fancy. Uh, I, and zoom a little. Okay. So this is my linear model, right? A linear model just has linear decision boundaries, right? And that's what I show you at the beginning. But then there are these issues, right? There are like intersections. So one line change, enter deep neural networks, we fix every problem. Okay. So let, let's zoom back in. I can't see anything otherwise. All right, cool. So what I change here, let me just execute this one first. What I change here is one line. I just added this positive part after the first layer, right? So again, uh, this stuff was, we go from N dimensions to D dimensions of the hidden layer. Then I, I, I zero out everything that is negative. And then we go from D to capital K, right? Uh, so the only difference between these two cells is the positive part. Add with ReLU equal. So this is a three layer network. I have an input, I have a hidden, and then I have an output value, okay? So there are two and then uh, modules here. The first, module maps the input, the first layer to the hidden layer, the D, right? And then they have this other, which is mapping the hidden layer to the output layer. So I have input, hidden, output, I count three. There are two modules, right? 
two. I don't know what's that two. All right, so the only difference was that I added one line. And are you ready to look at the performance? Yes, no? Okay, I'm already late, so I should not waste your time. <laughs> yes, okay. There you go. Accuracy 0.949, okay? Uh, let's print the model. Tada. Okay, you, you have tada to there you go. <laughs> okay. Does PyTorch do the one hot encoding by itself? Yeah, you can check the, the, the code, right? So you can change also from SGD to Adam. You can oh yes, I think that it changed. So someone can send a a, a poor request, please. Someone fix this stuff. But nevertheless, if you use for both networks, let's use Adam here as well, right? Adam, just to make sure. Adam. Okay, so this one is still zero five. Oh, because I think, uh, we had to specify, um, okay, so now both of them use the same, okay? I believe that I had to pick a better uh, learning rate, right? I didn't pick the, I picked the default learning rate here for, for SGD, okay? Now both of them use the same optimizer. You still see one uh, works and the other one does straight lines, okay? Good point, Randy. Okay. Uh, in the last 30 seconds, then I let you go. I show you instead this regression, right? So just to be uh, fully, you know, exp to show everything. I told you deep learning. So here I just do exactly the same thing. I apply the five steps. Once again, what are the five steps? Can you remind me on the chat? Five steps, forward, uh, loss computation, uh, clear up the gradients, right? Fourth is gonna be backprop, fifth is gonna be stepping, okay? Okay, so in this case, I'm gonna be trying to do regression and I try to get to learn this function over here. Uh, I start by using just a linear model. And of course, a linear model is gonna be just drawing a line through these points. Uh, but then let's use like now uh, a few networks. Uh, one network with the uh, one network with the Tina H hyperbolic tangent and one with the uh, ReLU. So these are my initial networks, right? So these are before training the networks are giving me basically uh, horizontal results. And they are not a green, of course, because they didn't see data, right? Then we fit these curves, right, to our own curve. And see, let's see how they, they look, right? So there we go. So in the left-hand side, I use the uh, redo. And you can see this is basically a piecewise linear interpolation, basically. Whereas here with the hyperbolic tangent, things are much smoother, okay? Uh, something interesting is going to be trying here a different zooming factor. Let's go four, way, four, four times further away. And so what happens is this following, right? So in this case, the network just goes straight linear because we've been using ReLUs. So the easiest thing to do is just keep going straight ahead. And you can see how the variance here increases, right? Uh, not too much. Instead, in this case, I use hyperbolic tangent. And you can see that as you go away from my training data, you're gonna be re-observing this kind of, you know, sigmoid shape, right? And then here, actually, the variance is much, increases much larger, like in a faster way. So the, the, the main point here is that if you train several networks by observing the standard deviation or the variance between multiple predictions, 
you can tell how far you are from the training manifold. Okay. So this is actually very, uh, a very, very important part. Okay. So usually whenever you train these regressors, you don't know exactly how well or how bad you're doing. But if you have multiple networks trained on that uh, data, you can always measure the level of agreement or well disagreement in order to estimate how far you are from this region. Okay. And again, different non-activation, no, no, no linear functions will show different kind of fringe behavior and right? behavior outside the training uh, region. I took 10 minutes too long. Well, all right. I think that was it, right? Uh, if there are more questions, please let us know on Campus Wire. We'll take any question there. Uh, thank you for being patient with me. See you next week. Bye. <laughs> Unless there are email questions. There are no questions, right? I, well, it's too late anyway. <laughs> All right. Thank you again for sticking around. And again, there are recordings for the one that left. Bye-bye. <laughs>